and other international events. Ladies and gentlemen, here's Georgette Reed. <laughs> Hi everyone, thank you so much for having me here today. It's wonderful to be a part of this session. Uh, it's so neat to be able to share my stories and my experiences and um, just kind of, I don't know, maybe enlighten a little bit and maybe just uh, give people an, an understanding of maybe some of the things that I went through um, to where I am right now. I currently um, work for the city of Edmonton as a, in fire rescue services as a health and wellness coordinator. But um, before this iteration of my, of my career, I started off as an athlete, as you've heard. And when I first started off as an athlete, I wasn't an athlete at all. Um, my dad, uh, his name is George Reed, and he played football for the Saskatchewan Rough Riders from 1963 to 1976. Go Riders, woo! And um, at eight years old, I was his youngest and biggest child. <laughs> and so my brother's five years older than me, and I was um, still quite a bit bigger than him at, as an eight-year-old. So my uh, dad decided that I needed to feel real good about myself and, and really work on my, on my prowess as a young lady. And so he put me in ballet. Now, when you're eight years old and you're four feet tall and 140 yeah. pounds, they don't have tutus to fit you. So they put two or three of them together and they wrap them all up and you pirouette around in that. Well, I wasn't that, I, I wasn't that, that graceful. So it ended up being like human bowling. And I just ended up running over all the other little kids. And my mom kept getting these nasty phone calls saying, you know, get your daughter away from here. She's killing our kids. And um, my mom decided that she would kind of watch me do things to see what I might be good at. And the one thing that I think I'm the best at, then my mom, um, to her chagrin, had to kind of agree, was eating. And so all I did was sit around the house and eat. Like I would eat like a half a loaf of bread for breakfast and three or four bowls of cereal. And then I grab, you know, a half a thing of orange juice. And after a while, my mom's like, well, this isn't going to do her any good. So we have to find her doing something else. So my mom one day kicked me out of the house. Um, we had a pool in our backyard. She made me go sit in the backyard and just kind of hang out. And I sitting at the edge of the pool and I fell in and I started to float. So instead of calling 911, my mom called the local swim team. And that's how I started my illustrious career in sports. Um, when I first started sport, um, it was interesting. It was an interesting experience because I always knew that I was a little bit different, but I just, you know, was a battering ram of, what, of energy and I would just go off and do whatever I wanted to do. But when I first got into swimming, you know, I had a lot of kids going, well, you don't belong here. And I'd be like, well, why don't I belong here? And they go, well, you don't look like us. And I'm like, well, yeah, I'm a little bit different, but you know, I can still swim. And they're like, no, you don't look like us. So we don't think you should be here. And so I would get in the pool and I try to start swimming and, and do what I could. And after a while with all the kids, like kind of shunning me and pushing me away and everything else, I started believing them that I didn't belong there. And so I would just kind of hang out in the locker room and just wait until it was time for my mom to come pick me up. I'd eat chocolate bars, read comic books. And then I would um, go into the shower and I wet my hair and I pinch my cheeks and I would come out of the pool or come out of the locker room and just tell my mom I had a hard practice and I wanted to go and eat. Well, my mom thought, okay, well, we're gonna let her keep swimming and let's see what she's doing. And one day she came to watch me and she did, couldn't find me in the pool and she went to look for me and found me in the locker room. And she asked me why I was in the locker room. And I said, well, the kids tell me I don't belong here. And she said, well, you know what? There's gonna be times in your life where you're not gonna really feel like you belong anywhere, but you just have to remember that you are a unique individual and you just have to go out and be the best you that you can be. And hopefully people will accept you for that. So I decided I'd keep swimming for a little while and see what would happen. And my dad was like, you know, just try your very best for the next couple of weeks and see where that goes. And I started trying and I started just kind of saying, okay, I'm unique. I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. I can do this. And before I knew it, two years turned in or two weeks turned into two years. And by the time I was 10 years old, 
I was one of the best 10 under swimmers in the country. And I started competing for the province of Saskatchewan. I started going all over Canada. Um, and then I thought, okay, I'm going to set a goal. I'm going to be an Olympic swimmer. So I remember training really, really hard for the next three years and just every day, uh, two and a half hours, every practice, 13 practices a week, just going like crazy. And one day I was swimming and I went to stroke and I went to put my arm in the water and I couldn't feel anything. <coughs> and I had been swimming so much because I set this goal of being an Olympic swimmer and that's all I wanted to do <laughs> that I ended up tearing all of my, my pectoral muscles. So across my chest and then my biceps, all so in my arms through here. And I thought, wow, you know, I really tried to do what I, that I wanted, what I wanted to do. I set a goal. I went and worked out as hard as I could. How come this isn't happening? And I realized that sometimes there's all, there's these things about balance and about being able to have flow and understanding that there's times when you need to rest and there's times when you need to kind of keep going forward. So I had to kind of take a step back and realize what it was that I wanted to do and, and why I was doing it. And one of the things that I realized that the reason why I started swimming was because I wanted to have fun. And the Olympic goal kind of took, took, took that over. And I realized that it's great to have goals and it's great to have things that you aspire to, but you also have to have put systems and things in place to make sure that, that you're also looking after yourself, that you're putting yourself in the equation and doing the things that you need to do. So I tried to rediscover what it was that I loved about swimming. And in doing that, I started coaching and I started working with little three and four year old swimmers and, uh, and working with Special Olympics. And it was really cool because you'd put the kids in the water and they'd snap on their caps and goggles and they'd spaz out and do whatever. And then they get to the end of the wall and they'd hit their head and they'd smile. And I, bet, I was like, you know what? It's about having fun. It's about enjoying your life. It's about being able to try to find something that supports that joy, that love, whatever it is that you have in everything that you do, even if you've done it a thousand times over. So when I started bringing joy and fun back into what it was that I was doing, I found that I started swimming faster. I found that I started um, accepting myself a little bit more. And I found that I started um, just being able to overcome some of the things that, that I had been going through. Because at a young age, I, I always kind of knew that, um, that I wasn't like, always like the other kids. I always knew that I had um, an affinity for, for liking women more than I did uh, with the boys, even though I had boyfriends and, and whatever or tried. And I was always just afraid of what might happen if I didn't present myself a certain way. So I know that I threw myself into my sports just to be able to keep moving forward and if I was a good enough swimmer if I was a good enough athlete then maybe the other stuff wouldn't matter well I remember um, swimming faster and stronger and doing really really well and by the time I was about 17 years old I got an uh, uh, invitation to go to Washington State University and swim on their swim team and I was so excited about going down there and I thought, okay, I'm going to get an education. I'm going to get, get another opportunity to uh, maybe try out for the Olympics and be a swimmer. And I went down to Washington State University and I walked into the swim coach's office and I said, hi, coach, I'm Georgette Reed. I'm here to swim on your swim team. And she looked at me and she said, who are you? And I said, I'm Georgette. And she says, you can't be. And I said, well, why not? And she says, because you're black and black people don't swim. And I looked at her and I was like, Hark? and she's like, black people don't swim. It's like, okay, I sent you my bio. I sent you pictures, black, white color. You could tell that I had a better tan than you. So come on, like I can swim. And she decided that she would hold my scholarship until I could prove to her that I could swim because she didn't believe in me. So she gave me a two week tryout. And for that two-week tryout, I had to um, show her that I could demonstrate speed in, in the front crawl and all these other things that I was recruited for. At the end of that two-week tryout, I was the best freestyler, best um, butterflyer, best backstroker, best breaststroker. Um, and I, I could do every, pretty much everything. And 
came up to her after the two week trial and I said, how did I do? And she said, you're fantastic. You're gonna be a great asset to this team, but I gave your scholarship away. And I thought, that's, that's not fair. It's like, I did everything that you asked me to do, but you gave it away. And she says, well, I didn't believe in you. And I thought, wow. And at that point in time, I was just like, okay, she may not believe in me, but I do. I'm just gonna see what I can do. So I remember um, staying on the team, doing the eight mandatory practices that she wanted me to do. I also threw five more in there because that's just who I am. I wanted to do better and do more. And then I had to get three different jobs, one working in an office, one working in a gym, and one working as a lifeguard to be able to pay my way through school because I knew that I still had an opportunity to get my education and I wanted to do that. Uh, I remember swimming and working and just going 100 miles a minute. And one day I was doing one of my workouts at lunchtime and I'm swimming along and I put my arm in the water and I couldn't feel anything. This time I had been swimming so much and doing so much to prove that coach wrong that I ended up ripping apart the muscles in my shoulder. The bones were just tearing apart my shoulder. And I was told that I could either have a surgery and have an incision that went halfway from my back all the way through the front of my shoulder, or I could try something new. Um, my dad always said, you know, you never quit. You just move on to something else or try something new. So I said, okay, I'm gonna try something new. But I never had an idea about what I wanted to do or what I could do um, because I had spent at that point in time, about 14 years in the pool. I was about 22, 20, 20, 20 years old um, by the time that I was finishing up all this stuff. And um, I thought, well, let's just try some things. So my friend of mine comes up to me and he goes, well, you know, you're a real big girl. And I said, thank you. And he says, well, why don't you try uh, come up for the football team? And I said, there's no way that the coach is going to let me play football. And they're like, yeah, you can. You're bigger than half the guys. Like, come on. So I, got, I went out for a tryout, and, and uh, I had the helmet and stuff on before I went on the field, so the coach didn't know I was a girl. And so one of my things that I was doing was kicking. I love to kick the ball, so I was a kicker. And I remember going through practice, and I'm doing these punts, and I'm doing these field goals and whatever, and, and he's like, oh, wow, I think we got ourselves a kicker here. you know. And so we went through a little scrimmage and whatever, and set it up for a field goal and I kicked a 50 yard field goal and the coach was just like all right we got we got a, a guy on our team who's going to kick the, the lights out of the ball come over here son introduce yourself so I go trotting over and then he goes take your helmet off son and I go okay went to pull my helmet off and he looks at me and he goes you're not a boy and I went no and he goes you're a girl and I went well duh and he goes girls, girls don't play football and I was just like, okay, I'm in a really strange place because right now I can't swim because I'm black. I'm not, I can't play football because I'm a girl. You know, I, I, I'm different. What am I supposed to do? And I had a friend that said, why don't you try track and field? I said, track and field? They said, yeah. And I said, that's a lot of running. And they went, well, there's other things. And I said, okay, well, I'll try track and field. So I walk into the coach's office and I say, hi, coach. I'm Georgette. I used to swim. I want to try a track. Never really done much. And he looks at me and he goes, well, you are a big girl. <laughs> and I was like, thank you. And he goes, uh, do you run? And I said, nope, you know, I'm, I'm the champion from the couch to the fridge, you know, during a commercial, but that's about it. And um, he says, but you are a big girl. And so he starts pulling out like the, the throwing implements and uh, he pulls out a shot put and it's uh, a big metal ball and it's about uh, four kilograms uh, in weight. So almost nine pounds and he's tossing around and he's juggling it and playing with it. And I said, oh, that looks pretty easy. Can I hold it? And he goes to hand it to me and it slipped off of my hand and it went towards the floor. And I thought, oh, this is gonna make a loud bang. And it didn't. And then I looked down and I actually dropped the shot on his foot. So that is how I started my track career. I broke my coach's foot with a shot. He let me still be part of the team but he was not happy with me. And I went out there and, and I didn't know much of, of anything. And, and uh, some of the girls befriended me and, and uh, became my friends. And they said, okay, let's go to the library, take out books, learn these different things. And so I, I got books and videotapes and things to learn about 
about throwing. And I started, you know, creating stronger friendships and, and whatnot. And I, I think that that was one of my first girlfriends was in college and, and, and she was part of the track team and she was the one that kind of helped lead me, lead me through things. And I found that the more that I started to learn and look and see things, the more I could see myself doing this event, even though pictures of athletes that had done this event before me were, you know, athletes that were six foot five, um, you know, 275 pounds, like ripped muscles and all those types of things. And I thought those were the guys and that's actually the Russians, but that's okay. The Russian women were just big girls. And um, I was just like, okay, I'm just going to go out there and, and do this and try it. And I had so much support, but I, I noticed that the better I got and the more that I started hanging out with my group of, of, uh, of girl um, athletes or women athletes, the more that that coach that I was working with kind of separated me away from the group. Um, he had a bias against uh, the female athletes and he just thought, you know, if you were strong and if you were um, any bit vocal or assertive that you were automatically one of those crazy lesbians and just stay away and, and, and they weren't, they weren't going to poison his team. And, you know, the, he loved his distance runners and things like that. And I found that at first I felt really isolated, you know, other than with the few girls that I hung out with, but I was really welcomed by the men's team. And so the men's coach started coaching me and I started training and lifting with the male uh, uh, throwers. And there was these two guys, uh, one was Tor <laughs> and he was from Iceland and one was Span and he was actually from Sweden. And um, they came up to me one day and they said, you want to throw? And I said, yeah, I want to learn how to throw. And they said, you're too small. <laughs> I looked and I went, everybody tells me I'm too big. And they said, you're too small. So they took me into the weight room and they had me doing um, all kinds of things and learning lifts. And my first year, I wasn't throwing very far and I wasn't lifting very much. And maybe, you know, uh, the bar, which is 45 pounds um, to be able to do a, a, a press and, and maybe twice that to be able to do squats. But every year they would just keep coming in and working with me. And by the second year, I started throwing a little bit farther and I was able to like bench press 150 pounds. I was able to squat like 275 pounds. And I started traveling with the team and the coach was just like, I don't know what you're doing or how you're doing it. Just keep doing it and do it over there. I was like, okay. So after my third year, I was able to bench press like 200 pounds. And I was able to squat 360 pounds for sets of four. And uh, I broke the school record and I started going to like the conference championships, national championships. And, and I had won my third, in my third year, I had won the Canadian national championship for shot put. And uh, my coach was like, well, I don't know what you're doing. Just keep doing it and do it over there. And so after my fourth year, I was able to bench press 267 pounds for sets of two. And I was able to squat 460 pounds for sets of four. Uh, that's probably the reason why I have no knees right now, but that's another story. Um, but I was strong and I was mobile and I, and I did all kinds of things. And my last year at university, I was able to um, not only be what they called an all-American or I always say I'm from Saskatchewan, that's as Canadian as it gets. And that's where I'm from. And they would be like, okay, you're whatever. And, but I was an All-American, I uh, finalist in, in the national championships for the NC2A. I uh, broke the school record by over 12 feet. And that record had stood for over, before I had broken it before, had stood for over 12 years. And to my knowledge, nobody's broken that record yet. So it's kind of neat. And I qualified for my first Olympic team. And I ended up doing that as a shot putter playing with a little marble. Whereas when I was that little eight-year-old kid, I always thought I would do it as a swimmer. And so I realized then that, you know, we all set goals and we all have things that we aspire to, but they may not always work out the way that we plan. So to always be flexible. Um, I remember going to the Olympic Games and it was incredible to represent my country. Um, and there's, there was always still a little bias. You know, you had some of the, some of the, um, the national team officials that were like, okay, and these are the rules. And, you know, 
don't do this, don't do that, you know, and doors open and all these types of things. Cause I have to admit the Olympics is a free for all for um, uh, bad behavior um, after people finish competing. Um, no word of a lie, there's contraception everywhere. Like there's condoms and different things everywhere in the village because they know that once people finish competing, that it just becomes like a, an orgy fest. It's, it's very scary <laughs> in many ways. But um, I know that there is always people like, you know, kind of segregating or pushing people away from certain things. And after a while, I was just, I just kind of stayed on my own and stayed on my track and just said, if I just keep being me and doing what I do, um, hopefully people will leave me alone. And so I really became invested in being the best athlete the best everything that I could be and and I think it kind of made me a little bit of a an overachiever or somebody who really wanted to to accomplish things to let people know that it didn't matter who I was or where I came from that I did these things because I had the ability and the talent and I wanted to um, and I wasn't going to let labels or other people's thoughts kind of steer me away from what I figured was going to be my, my destiny or what it was that I wanted to accomplish. Um, it was interesting. After my first Olympic Games um, in Barcelona in 1992, that was the only Olympics that I made as an athlete. And it wasn't because I wasn't the best um, shot putter. Uh, I won 17 national titles and, and, and uh, competed at many, many international events. But I remember in 1996, there was a quota uh, for spots and they filled up the spots with the relays and with the, the sprinters because they had the chance of winning medals. And I was about 46. Um, when, I, um, when, I just, when, I just, when that happened to me and I missed the team, I thought, okay, 2000, I'm not gonna miss the team. I'm gonna do everything that I can to make it. And I remember I qualified in two events, shot put and discus. And about a week before Olympic trials, because you have to go to Olympic trials and come in the top three, um, I was eating a cheese pizza and I had an allergic reaction and I, it triggered an asthma attack. And I was flat on my back for three days and I felt like I had an elephant sitting on my chest and that I was breathing through a straw. And I realized at that point in time that there's nothing more important than looking after your health and to be able to make sure that you kind of keep your priorities in, in, in line. I remember getting up on that fourth day and getting on a plane, getting out to Victoria and talking to the coaches and they just said, well, you have to come to the top three. And I remember going to my first event, which was discus and uh, through pretty hard, did as hard as I could. And I ended up coming in fourth by 10 centimeters. And I was like, darn, okay, that's all right. Shot puts my event, I'm gonna make it. I went into the shot put the next day up until the last throw, the, like the last rounds, we have six rounds of throws. Up until the last round, I was in third place. So I thought, okay, this is good. Everything's gonna be all right. One of the throwers that was in fourth place from behind me had an amazing throw. and I, for my last throw, I couldn't top it. So I ended up missing the team by four centimeters. And I thought, oh man, like this is crazy. I, I've worked so hard for this. I put everything else into it. What else is going to happen? And it was pretty funny because it was like a, not even a day later, I get a phone call. How would you like to hurl your, ice, your, your body down the ice at 130 kilometers an hour? And I'm like, what? <laughs> and, they, and it was the National Women's Bobsleigh team that called me and they said, well, you're a big girl, but you're fast and you're strong. And we need, we need weight in the back of the sled to be able to uh, get our teams qualified for the, for the Olympic games in 2002. So I got a chance to join the national women's bobsleigh team and compete on international level and travel around the world. And it taught me about working with a team. And it started teaching me more and more about character means more than whatever labels you're given. So I realized that if I was a good teammate and did my very best and treated everybody the way that I wanted to be treated and actually treat people better than the way I wanted to be treated, that that meant more than what anybody thought of me and whatever labels that I got put upon me. And 
I loved Bob's like, because it taught me so much about working with people and being around more people and, and being responsible to other people. Because as a shot putter, it's just you in the circle. And usually nobody ever comes to watch the shot put. So, you know, you're lucky if you might have seven people out there and most of them are either family or friends. And it's usually because you promised them dinner afterward or something. So, you know, but with bobsleigh, you've got a whole slew of people that are doing things and you're responsible to the driver because I was a brakeman. And so as a, as a brakeman, you're the one responsible for shining the runners, you know, at three o'clock in the morning to make sure that they're like glass. So then that way it helps um, on, the, on the track. And it was really cool to kind of start coming into my own. I really started to believe in, in myself and the person who I was and realized that I, can, I just have to be who I am. I'm not, I'm not going to change people's minds by, um, by trying to tell them about who I was. So I figured that the best way was to show them. And I had a great experience with, with bobsleigh. And when it came to the final... Um, selections for for the team for 2002 in Barcelona I was the alternate I missed the team by 17 one thousandths of a second um, because the only way that they could select the team was to do a push-off and so uh, it was between me and another athlete and she beat me by 17 one thousandths of a second at that point in time I was like okay well I've done everything that I've, I think that I've wanted to do in sport what am I do what do I do now and I had a friend that that suggested that I move up to Edmonton and I started uh, doing a little bit of coaching here and I was working at uh, Ross Shepherd High School and I was in the fitness area and I became part of the, the Rainbows program and the Rainbows program was a, a, a mental health program, a, a grief and trauma program um, that was put together for students and staff to be able to deal with um, things that they had gone through. and. Um, I really found that I had an affinity then for dealing with mental health and helping people and assisting people. And I remember distinctly one of the, the students that I worked with, um, would, we'd have lunchtime sessions and she would come to every lunchtime session, but she wouldn't say anything. She wouldn't be part of the conversation. And she came for about eight weeks in a row, didn't say anything, but would listen to everybody else's conversations. And then at the end of about the eighth week or so, she came up to me after the end of the session and she says, okay, I'm ready to talk now. And I, I looked at her and I said, do you mind me asking um, why now? And she said, because you listen and I need somebody to listen. And that was the hugest lesson that I ever got was about just being able to hold space and listen. So she told me her story that her mother had taken her life and her father not being able to deal with the grief and the memories that she um, that she presented for him uh, left her to live with her aunt to finish off high school. And he sold the house and everything in Edmonton and moved to Salt Spring Island. And she's like, what did I do? And I said, you didn't do anything. And she happened, she happened to be um, lesbian. And she says, well, is it because I'm gay that he left? Is it because I'm gay that my mom... Um, took her life. And I said, no, I said, people have things that they're dealing with. And we never know what people are dealing with. All we know is that we can just be as compassionate and as empathetic and as ourselves as we can be. And in doing that, hopefully we can create that connection, that passion, that, that ability to help people hopefully not make a permanent decision for a temporary situation. So that taught me a lot. And so I started moving more into um, working with mental health, especially when I got into the university. Um, at the University of Alberta, I ended up being the head coach for the track and field team there for about 10 years and dealt with a lot of, um, a lot of different scenarios, a uh, lot of uh, things with, with athletes, you know, in that 17, 18, 19 um, age range where they're discovering themselves and they're trying to figure out what's going on with their lives and, and what they're going to do or who they are or what their identities are. And I tried my very best to let everybody know that I didn't care who you were. I didn't care where you came from. I didn't care what you looked like. I didn't care um, what your preferences were. Everybody is welcome on this team. You all have something to contribute 
And as long as you're willing to contribute and be a part of the team and support each other, then that was, a, that was the, the only prerequisite for being on the team. Um, even talent and ability, it's like, as long as you supported the other athletes, it didn't matter if you were the star or if you were an alternate, everybody mattered. And that was a, a, a wonderful experience to try to be able to foster um, some kind of community. And it's really interesting for me now because as I travel around and do different things and I run into my old athletes and they're still friends with the people that they met on the team, they're still doing things together. Some of them are married. Um, many of them are, are um, doing amazing things in the community. And it taught me so much about, again, your, it's more your character and it's more about what you put out and, and how you treat people than more about what you're identified as. Um, but I still had lots of um, issues, um, even, at, even at the U of A, even in the university system. Um, you know, I dealt with athletic directors and other coaches that you know, wouldn't come up and ask me you know, um, if I was a lesbian or what my sexual preferences or whatever were, are, they would just, they would do the gossip and the whispering and they would, then they would just kind of do all the peripheral stuff. And there was a, a few times when I would say things, but most times I would just let it go. And sometimes I wonder if I should have, you know, kind of stood my ground a little bit more and said, you know, that's not appropriate. But um, I think with all of my experiences in my life and, and dealing with being a woman of color, um, you know, being, being a lesbian, being an athlete, all those things, I always start kind of ask myself, what hill do I want to die on? And is this one of those ones that I really want to, to fight? Um, you, it's really hard to fight stupidity. You, you, you can't fight ignorance. You can educate to the best of your ability. That doesn't mean that people will learn anything. So I always just try to just walk the walk and just be the best me that I can be in and doing that, hopefully things get better. So I know that my years with the university were um, amazing. And, and again, it really showed me the importance of, of mental health. And um, I've, I've, I've lost a, a, a few friends that, you know, made that, that permanent decision because of the, the thing that they were going through. And I, I found that more than anything, compassion, and empathy and just being able to to have that skill for listening um, has meant so much more than to me even more than you know some of the the high the highs of my athletic career I figured that everything that I've gone through has been a stepping stone to take me to where I am now um, it's it's exciting for me to be able to um, assist people and help people like I'm working with fire right now and being able to help people with their mental health and being able to help them with their physical health and, and, and chronic health issues and on all these things, because sometimes people just need somebody that's there, somebody that they can look, look up to or look forward to, or, or can reach out to. And that's the, the thing that I try to do now. And someone asked me the other day, what was my, my, what's my proudest moment? You know, what's the thing that I'm most proud of? And uh, I think they were expecting me to talk about being an Olympics or national champion or, or any of those things. And I said, I think the thing that I'm most proud of is making a connection with someone at their, who was at their lowest point. And even though it took nine hours, we, I was able to keep them safe for now. We were able to have that conversation I was able to let them know that they were cared for and that they were seen and that helped them get through something that they never thought they could get through. And when I think about that, that's probably my proudest moment or the thing that I love the best because it's about connection. And I think sometimes, and especially in this COVID environment, we've lost so much connection. I mean, Zoom is great, you know, and seeing all the little pixels, I feel like I'm part of the Brady Bunch and I can pick out, you know, Marsha and all the, you know, the different friends and stuff. And, but um, there's nothing like being around people that you feel connected to and people that you, that you can, you know, just be yourself with. And, you know, um, just being able to feel like you belong somewhere is, is so important. 
Um, I'm so grateful that in this city that we, we have a little bit more of an inclusive environment and that we have the Pride Center and that we've had people such as, as, as Michael Fair that have you know, gone through and kind of paved the way and, and, and done things to help all of us find a place where we belong so we can feel a little better and feel like we're not alone. I think that's the biggest thing. I think that's the most incredible thing. So anyway, I've probably chatted too long. Let's, <laughs> I got lots of time for some time for questions if, uh, if you have some questions out there. So inspired. <laughs> I could listen to you talk all day long, Georgia. That was just <laughs> wonderful. But I'm sure there's lots of questions from the members of our session here. If you'd like to use the chat box or raise the yellow hand and we'll try to uh, get you all in. But any questions from anybody? I have a question from Heather Fairburn that asks me about um, the pain from overtraining, you know, and looking after your body. And it's, it's interesting now because being a, I still try to do master's athletics and some other little things, but I'm so much smarter now than what I was when I was a younger athlete, because I mean, I, I probably will have to end up getting two knee replacements eventually. You know, you don't think about that when you're in your 20s, or early 30s, and you're, you know, lifting a house for no real reason other than <laughs> for the pure task of trying to do it. Um, but now it, it's like, you know, a little bit of the, of the pain for the knees and some chronic things, but I'm, I'm learning about training smarter and I'm also educating myself. So I now do a lot of corrective exercise and I um, certified in correct, corrective exercise techniques. And then I also um, am doing a lot of work with uh, the Functional Aging Institute. So training the older adult. So finding ways of movement for all of us. So it doesn't matter if you have bad knees, bad shoulder, bad back, finding ways that you can move to be able to strengthen and lengthen and improve your quality of life. And then finding different activities, you know, like going on, on what they call rucks, which are just long walks with poles. And, and, you know, you put a little bit of weight in, in a backpack or something like that to be able to help build your strength. So I think now that I'm older, I'm, I'm a little bit wiser and I want to be able to support uh, um, others in that, in that thing. So um, hopefully even putting together the, uh, a weight room or a fitness facility in our, in our, uh, in our, uh, I don't want to call it retirement home, but whatever. <laughs> it's genuine. Yeah. No, <laughs> I can to... see that Ace has a question. He has a sad back. Yeah, but before we do that, Larry, um, uh, Charles has yeah. a comment. He says it's inspiring. And I, I totally agree. Uh, and I, Ace, Ace do you want to go ahead with your question? Go ahead, Ace. Oh, I just want to say, I, I know you. <laughs> And I think I remember you in Calgary. Yep. Oh, do you remember? Yes, I do now. <laughs> yeah, do you remember? Uh, 318? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Was, this is I before I transitioned, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, yeah. And I, uh, I was going through some stuff that I felt also that I was thinking of your story about the one that uh, said that you know, because you lived, they were able to share, they felt safe to share. Um, I felt that I was able to share some things with you that I was uh, really afraid to share with other people. And one is that I was in an abuse, I was in an abusive lesbian relationship um, that I wasn't able to share because I was dealing with their alcoholism. And I felt that I was the masculine one that needed to not complain if I got, you know, hit or whatever kind of thing. Um, I also knew that I, I found out through therapy that some of the man bashing that some of the women were doing around me uh, caused me to cut up because I knew I was a man. I had a real huge problem with that because I felt like denying the sisterhood or denying womanhood was like denying my mother. And it was just, a, it was a huge psychological, could I be a man that could be um done the way i want it to to be that that they would be not with toxic masculinity and uh, male privilege and all that stuff 
I, I felt I had to leave Calgary to do that. Um, but in doing so, I left a community that I thought might have eventually been a supportive towards me. So um, I've just felt all alone for the longest time. I would be in a crowd and I would feel alone. So the fact that you're doing this work for mental health means a lot to me because I do have the anxiety, the depression, the PTSD, um, the things that I'm dealing with. I'm often reluctant to go into groups that are helpful because there's so many straight people there that I, I assume, and I assume wrongly, that they would not be understanding of me as a trans man, as a former lesbian who um, feels like I, I'm a bet, uh, the best man for the job was a woman. <laughs> you know, like I do, I have experienced a lot. I, I take Grace with me. I, I don't divorce myself from her. So I did even do things differently than the authorities were suggesting I do. But I remember you. Yeah. I remember you helping with my girlfriend when she was <laughs> pretty drunk <laughs> and being very understanding and not being in judgment. So that was great. Thank you so much, Ace. Um, we'll uh, sure find a way to put experience. you in touch with Georgette in the future. Uh, we have some comments in the chat room. Uh, Sydney sure. uh, is like wanting that. to know if there's advice for seniors. And on the same line, Eric Story has asked about functional training for older adults. Sounds very interesting. Can you tell us where that might be available in Edmonton? I'll have to do some research about where it is. Um, it's something that comes out of the U.S. So the, the Functional Aging Institute is, uh, I think they're in California. And um, I became more associated with them this, um, this summer. And they have a, a group that sponsors them and it's called Growing Boulder. And it's a group for seniors. And so they have all kinds of information. Um, they have a little website. They have um, community uh, gatherings virtually. And uh, you can get onto their um, their kind of list, and you'll get little um, little cute little sayings and things every every morning. But it comes from people that are seniors that are you know have experience and have have aged well. Um, and it's really it's really a, quite a neat site. It's um, again it's called Growing Boulder. So uh, just check that out, and you'll find there's all kinds of information. There's information on. Um, health and wellness. There's information with mental health. Um, you'll get stories of, of, of different individuals. I think there was just one I was reading on Jamie Lee Curtis and then some other leaders. Um, they have um, stuff with travel. I mean, it, it's, it's quite a community and they have quite a few um, uh, virtual seminars and, and things like that where they sponsor and, and bring in people to talk about the different issues that um, uh, are affecting uh, anybody over 55 or affecting seniors. So, um, so hopefully I'll find out more about that. I would like to actually um, spend more time certifying and training the older adult and working with uh, um, the Functional Aging Institute because I would like to be able to offer some of those things here. So um, stay tuned. Maybe there's something that I can put together. Don, maybe something we can do at the Pride Center or whatever, and we'll put something together <laughs> and, and do some, some sessions. So. I see there's two more questions. Michael Bear has his hand raised and then we'll go to Robert. Go ahead, Michael. Uh, thanks, and uh, 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 absolutely uh, delightful to uh, to hear what you had to say today. And I, I'm always amazed at um, listening to people like yourself and how both inspiring, but also um, uh, uh, how much it, it kind of, um, uh, it sits with, with people like me that, that, you know, life is really interesting and worth living kind of thing in that. And I think you help exemplify that. I also noticed though that you do well with challenges. So so you, you know you're just at the right point where you should be thinking about a political life. That, you know, City Hall could use you in that. And so um I'm I'm suggesting that that you know a bit about the city now and um because of your work. Um and that um uh it would it would be a, a nice challenge. So I'll just leave it with that. Um, and others can kind of spur you along every now and then over the next year or so kind of thing. And you can, you know, learn more about it kind of thing that too. So I, I will look forward to that day when you um, decide to put your hat in the ring. But, but thank you so much for, for what you had to say as well. And, and remember the challenge that I put forward. 
Thank you, Michael. I, I definitely will. Um, I've had a few people tell me that I should look at doing some things um, politically. And, and I, actually, I live outside of the city now, so I'd have to move back into the city to be able to represent the city. But I was just asked this morning to be part of a recreational board out where I live in Spring Lake. So we'll see. I'll, I'm going to be putting together some, some recreational activities and a, and a center and a whole bunch of stuff out there. So I'll start off small there, and then I'll build up, and then maybe move back into the city when... Uh, when the, the, our housing project comes together, <laughs> that's when I'll come back. <laughs> well, when you decide to run, I'll certainly work on your campaign. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you. <laughs> Joan, please go ahead. Uh, hi, Georgia. thank you so much for that talk. Um, it was amazing and thank you for not giving up. Um, I just am curious if you have any comments about uh, a very touchy subject for, for myself and for lots of people I know, but uh, body image, you seem really so put together and has it ever really been a deterrent for you or is it something you struggle with or, you know, whatever? I'd be interested to hear. Uh, I think I've always struggled with my body because I've always been a big girl, like from the time that I, I was young. Um, I have pictures that my mom has showed me, like when I was four, I was the cutesy and I had the ponytails and I looked good in the little dresses and stuff like that. But after that, I was always the, the big burly kind of kid. And, and I always felt like I was kind of like the ugly duckling. Like I didn't fit in with everybody else because I wasn't small and I wasn't petite. And, and I got that through swimming that I wasn't, I didn't look like the other girls. I wasn't small and petite. Um, when I finally got into throwing like track and field you people wanted you to be bigger and I got really big and then I got to the point where I was like I wasn't comfortable being really big but I think you know I struggled I yo-yoed back and forth between trying to be really small and, and tiny I remember for bobsleigh I remember trying to get um be strong but to be smaller and um I I remember losing a whole bunch of weight and I kind of felt like I remember, I remember the first time that Oprah lost a lot of weight and she came out in her skinny jeans and her black tank and her black uh, turtleneck. I did kind of the same thing. I lost a ton of weight and put on the skinny jeans and, and I felt terrible. And so I wrestled with that back and forth and it probably wasn't until, wow, maybe even to my, my late forties and, and, and early fifties that I started going, you know what? The goal is to be healthy doesn't matter what I look like. There's always going to be a different size clothing, clothing or whatever I can, I can find to be able to dress appropriately for my size. But I, my goal was to be healthy. And if I was healthy on the inside and work from the inside out, then the outside was going to be beautiful. If I let the inside be beautiful, then the outside could be beautiful. But it takes a lot and it takes acceptance and it takes it takes the commitment to not judge yourself. Like we always try to make the commitment to not judge others, but yet we're probably our own harshest critics. Like we'll say things to ourselves in the mirror that we would never say to anybody else. And my whole thing was to stop that, was that every time I look in the mirror, no matter how I look, I tell myself that I'm beautiful. I tell myself that I'm worthy. And I say, Let, let's go. And it took me a while to develop that. But now when I chat with people, I try to say, you know, that it's, it's what's on the inside that counts and bring that out. And don't worry about what the tape measure says. Don't worry about what the sizes say. Don't worry about how other people see you. It's how you see you. And if you can see yourself in a positive light, then it makes it a little bit easier for you to, to keep moving forward and doing the things that you need to do. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So Charles, um, I'm sorry, Robert's question is in the uh, chat room. He said, he's asking, what is most amazing is not your successes, but your resilience. Where does that come from? Um, my dad would tell me it was because I'm hardheaded and stubborn. Um, but mostly, I think it's just, I just, I'm always looking forward. I always try to look forward. Like I appreciate and I'm grateful for where I am right now and for the things that I have right now and what's happening. But I always find that I, I try to resist that temptation to stay where I am and that I always try to keep moving forward. And in doing that, when you're going through terrible things, when you're dealing with tragedy or grief or trauma, what it does is it lets me know that this too shall pass. And I just have to take a little step tomorrow 
to keep moving forward. And if I can do that, then I can move towards healing. I can move towards um, happiness. I can move towards what it is that I need to, to, to keep me doing what it is that I want to do. So I think that's kind of where the resilience has come from. Some of it, you know, comes from that athletic mindset of, of setting goals, you know, and achieving them and all those types of things. But I've always said to people that it's not about setting goals and accomplishing them that, that's kept me resilient or maybe successful. It's about building the systems and having systems in place that give me some structure to be able to keep moving along to accomplish whatever it is that I'm doing. Because that way, if I work with the systems, whether or not I achieve the goal or not achieve the goal, I've still made progress. So that's kind of how I look at it. And Larry, Larry Jewell has a question. Uh, firstly, a thank you uh, to you, uh, Ger uh, Georgette. Uh, I mean, my experience in some ways almost the opposite number of yours in that, and I suspect I'm not the only gay man here who avoided sports because I didn't feel I could possibly belong and, and went into other things to try to deal with it. And I wonder whether you've got any observations that might be helpful for this whole issue of sports avoidance um, among gay men. Um, and uh, you know, your, your experience is so inspiring uh, that uh, you have something to offer, I'm sure, for all of us. Thanks, Georgia. Well, thank you for your question, Larry. I think what it boils down to for me um, and from my experiences is that you have to find something that you love to do. And if you find that thing that you're passionate about and you love to do it, then you work on pursuing that. And you find the supports within your, your friends or that system to be able to help you accomplish that. And I found that whatever it is that I wanted to do, if I would work with my passion rather than um, enhancing my fear or my, my avoidance, that it allowed me to kind of move forward. So I always, you know, sports was always something that I love to do. But one of the things that I also am passionate about is art. And I, I do a, a ton of abstract art. Um, I, I dabble in it. I, I, I haven't put it out there yet. I know I should. I have, uh, I have like 400 pieces of all these different things that I've done. But it was always kind of like, well, you can't be an artist because you're an athlete. And it's like, no, you can be anything that you'd like to be as long as you're passionate about it and you pursue it with that love and that joy. And if you can do that, then hopefully you can kind of step over a lot of the you know, a lot of that, that avoidance type feeling of, of not being able to do it because um, of how you, how you identify or who, how people identify you. And so it's about you're doing this because you're passionate about what it is that you're doing. And if more people can try to put the passion above the, the fear or the, or, the, or the pain, then hopefully they can start enjoying more things and get involved in more things that they usually wouldn't get involved with. Um, I recently read a, a quote and it talked about the difference between fear and doubt and that fear is something that's, that's natural and normal. And it's something that, that will get us to, to move. Hopefully it gets us to move. It's doubt that paralyzes us. Fear is natural doubt. We have to invite in. And so my whole thing is not, not to invite in the doubt anymore and uh, use whatever I can to inspire me to keep moving forward. So so it's uh, five, we have five minutes left, well, maybe four. I think we have time for one last question and that would be from Dawn. Um, and her question is, what concerns have people come to you with during COVID and what advice can you give to us who are coping? The, the biggest thing is the mental health. It's about, about not having connection. That loss of connection has been huge because we've been isolated. We've not been able to be with our groups of people, we haven't been able to be at events. We haven't been able to, to do things. And like I said, you know, this whole Brady Bunch thing with Zoom is wonderful, except it's not connecting. It's the same way that I say that emails and texts and things are great for information, but it's not about conversation. It's not about connection. 
So one of the things that I think we need to really try to do is find ways to connect again. And if we can do that, I think that will help with at least lessening some of the, the issues that we have with, with um, our anxieties and our depressions and our mental health, because when we feel like we're supported, we, we're able to move forward. It's when you don't feel supported and don't feel connected that it makes it more difficult to do the things that you want, want to do. So inspiring. So um, the Edmonton Pride Seniors Group is working on getting some seniors LGBTQ housing and Georgette has agreed to step in and come consult with us and set up our uh, fitness and training uh, session and room and I just I can't wait to see that come to fruition because uh, she's certainly great at it. Thank you Georgette for such a thoughtful and wide wide ranging talk. Um, Thank you too to Kim Lauren for his signing and technical assistance. And thank you to all of you. Aging with Pride will not be meeting next week on Remembrance Day. I hope that we will see you the following week, November 18th, when our speaker will be John McDougall, and he will be discussing LGBTQ2S plus issues in the military. I would ask a further favor. We will be sending you a short evaluation questionnaire Please fill it out and return it to us. Your opinions are crucial for planning future programs. You can contact us at agingwithpride at pridecenteredmonton.ca. And now I return the meeting to our host, Kim. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. I will see you in two weeks. Bye. Bye. <laughs>